Hello, and welcome to the fifth debate in the 2017 NDP leadership race. I'm Tria Donaldson, and today we're coming to you live from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I'd like to welcome everyone who has joined us here in Saskatoon, those taking part in the conversation online at ndp.ca, and of course, all of you watching at home. I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and home of the Métis people. Today's debate will take place largely in English with one French question. It is our intention that the candidates answer each question in the language in which it is posed, but that is the choice of the candidate. Once again, just a reminder to hold all of your applause till the end. So let's get right to us. Please welcome our candidates, Guy Caron, Jagmeet Singh, Nikki Ashton, and Charlie Angus. I'd like... I'd like to take a moment to explain one new element of the format that we will be introducing today. Each candidate has a cue card, which, um, a cue card with them at their table. At one point through the debate, whenever they choose, if they raise this cue card, they will get to speak for an additional 60, 30 seconds whenever the current response or debate is concluded. Each candidate can do this one, one time whenever they wish. And after the current response is done, they will have the floor for 30 seconds. And again, they can only do it once. If two candidates raise their card during the same response, I will use my judgment to determine who raised their card first. And that person will get their 30 seconds first out of the two. Now let's begin. Good luck to all of the candidates. We will start with an opening statement of 60 seconds from each candidate. Charlie Angus, you are first. Please begin. Good afternoon, Saskatchewan. I'm honoured to be here on Treaty 6 in the homeland of the Métis people and honoured to share my vision for bringing us to victory in 2019. And part of that renewal is what we're doing here because bold ideas are the bedrock of social democracy, but we can only win if it's rooted in building community. We, my friends, are called to be the voice of those who've been written off the political and economic map of our nation, to channel their hopes and their frustrations and their dreams into a coherent, roadmap for change. I've spent my political life building that roadmap, whether it was working with the homeless in Toronto, working with farmers to defend the watershed of the north, or working with Indigenous youth to bring a campaign of hope across this country. So here, in the birthplace of the NDP, let's talk about that roadmap to winning in 2019. I'm in this, my friends, to win, because our movement is needed now more than ever. Thank you very much. Today, this is where we recognize it all started, here in my home region, the Prairies. The forerunner of the NDP, the CCF, founded in Calgary and Regina in the 30s, the first CCF government in Saskatchewan in 1944. Our movement dared to dream of Medicare, pensions, minimum wages and unemployment insurance, of public ownership for the public good, of a politics that does not seek power for its own sake, but to change Canada and the world. It is time to dream again, of a society driven by human need, not corporate greed, of leaving our planet in better shape than we found it, a Canada that seeks peace and justice at home and around the world. As Tommy Douglas said, we should never, never be afraid or ashamed about dreams. Let's dream about building a movement for fundamental change, of forming the first NDP government to achieve social, environmental, and economic justice for all. Um, just a reminder, we're asking everyone to hold their applause till the end of the debate. Um, and Mr. Caron, you're next. My friends, this campaign has allowed you to get to know me a bit better, but more importantly, it allowed me to hear your stories. Dans ces, ces quatre derniers mois, j'ai parcouru le pays, de Rimouski à saint John's à Victoria, uh, en passant, évidemment, hier à Prince Albert. And what I heard is that people are worried about the future, and so am I. I'm worried about the Canada in which my kids, Dominic and Edie, will grow up in. I'm worried about taking care of my parents who are entering their golden years. I'm worried about our government and that, the fact that our government is so beholden to uh, big business to make the changes that we need right now. But we can do it. To do it, we need everybody, everyone to pull in the same direction. And I'm asking you to put your trust in me to lead the NDP 
for the 2019 election. I've shown that I can put forward a credible and visionary platform that will force the old line parties to play on progressive NDP turf. I will unite progressives from every part of the country to elect the first NDP government. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge the Treaty 6 territories and the Métis Nation and the birthplace of our incredible party. This race is about who can grow our party so we form the first NDP government in history. I've met with thousands of people across our country and I've connected with them on their struggles. And it's clear to me, Canadians all share NDP values of social and economic justice. They believe in fairness. Ils veulent des lois qui démantèlent les inégalités au lieu de les accroître. Ils veulent un Canada plus inclusif où nous apprenons l'un et l'autre. But too many feel like they don't belong. People who can't find a decent job or a home, people who face discrimination, who fear for the future, they feel betrayed. They don't have a political home, and I want to give them a home. I'm the growth candidate in this race, and I'm connecting with people and bringing them to our home with the NDP. This is our path to victory because we owe it to Canadians to form government in 2019. Thank you very much. Thank you, candidates. Now let's get right to the first question. It is asked to all of the candidates and you'll each have a chance to respond for one minute. Most experts believe that to seriously tackle emissions in Canada, a significant national price on carbon is necessary. Yet the premiers of Saskatchewan and Manitoba remain fir firmly opposed to any national carbon price. How would you, if you were prime minister, reconcile this? And the first response goes to Charlie Angus. What we need to do is we have to legislate the limits on the hard caps. That is the first step to making sure that we have to meet our international obligations. And I would like to compare the work of Rachel Notley, who is doing an incredible work of taking their price on carbon and reinvesting it in public transit. Meanwhile, we got Brad Wall, what he's doing, he's cutting rural transit. Is that a vision? I mean, the guy, no offense, but he's like the man violently defending the future of the typewriter when everyone else has moved to cell phones. We have an enormous <laughs> renewable potential here in Saskatchewan and Alberta. What will I do? I will work with any government on the prairies that's willing to diversify our economy so that we can build a way forward. And Mr. Wall, I'm sorry, but the 20th century is over. And we're well into the 21st century and you look at the massive potential for renewables, the diversification of our economy in the West, and I'd say get on the program and start working with us. Ms. Ashton, you're next. Well, first of all, coming from Manitoba, I can say that my Premier, Brian Palliser, doesn't speak for me. And I'm venturing a guess that a lot of people here in this room don't feel that Brad Wall speaks for them. So I think, first of all, it's important to make clear that we have an NDP vision, a progressive vision that states clearly that climate change is not a hoax, it is real, and we need to take it seriously. I'm proud of the leadership we have put forward as the NDP so far at the federal level when it comes to climate change. And for me, it would be very important to work with the Saskatchewan team, Sherry Benson, Aaron Weir, Georgina Jolibois, MPs who understand the reality here in Saskatchewan, along with the Rachel Notley government in Alberta that has come forward with an innovative plan, making sure that uh, low-income uh, uh, Canadians and residents here in the prairies aren't uh, uh, taxed and, and, and punished, uh, but making sure as well that we are supporting diversification, that we are looking at creating good, sustainable green jobs in our communities here across the prairies. Thank you. Mr. Singh. Thank you very much. Well, first thing, we need to acknowledge that one size doesn't fit all when it comes to a carbon plan. Uh, we acknowledge we need to put a price on carbon so that we fight climate change, but we need to also know that every province is different, so we have to approach that differently. So that's one of the things I propose in my climate change plan, that we look at each province and find ways to provide a solution that is actually appropriate to the province. Just on, on Brad Wall, we've heard uh, what a callous and savage budget that slashed so many services that people depend on. This is not the leadership that's gonna take us into the next generation, not on social justice or environmental justice. So what we need to do is we have a choice now. We can continue to go down a certain path where we know is not sustainable, or we can make sure that we have a path towards making environmental justice a reality that ensures that people are not left behind. So my plan also proposes if we're going to bring in a carbon tax, that also has to be twinned with rebates for low and middle income families. So they're not disproportionately impacted, which we know will happen otherwise. Uh, Mr. Caron, you're next. Well, plainly, plainly put, Brian, uh, Brian Palliser and Brad Wall are wrong. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it says something when those two premiers are going in the wrong directions, when even the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and the Canadian Mining Association are in favor of carbon pricing. They know that this is part of our future. And this is a type of thinking that left us behind and, and lagging behind most of the European countries on this. Uh, you know, Germany and Denmark and, uh, and this Norway and the Scandinavian countries are way ahead of us. And by holding, back like, uh, holding us back like this, we're prevented uh, our place in a future, an innovative future, in, in being able to develop and, and prioritize green technologies. We're talking about carbon pricing. We need to move in that direction. We also need to move in the direction of uh, electrification of transport to ensure that we are making it easier to do that transformation, that transition for a better future. Great, thank you. Now we will move to a period of open debate, debate amongst all four candidates. I'll ask a question and the floor will be open to all of you for four minutes. The question is, oil and gas are significant employers and drivers of wealth in the Canadian prairies. Many people working in the resource sector are concerned about the future of their jobs. As NDP leader, what policies would you advocate for this sector? Well, I think it's really important to be talking about this here in Saskatchewan. I come from a resource economy. In fact, many of the people from my region work in Fort St. John and Fort Mac and other communities uh, because we've allowed across this country our regional economies to atrophy. And so we are heavily dependent on oil and gas. What we need to do, but what we need to do is we need to legislate the hard limits and then tell industry we, we will work with you if you're going to meet those targets, but it's about diversification and the future of our economy. This is where I've been in Alberta meeting with energy workers who are retraining. They want that new economy. We've Charles, got to be part of it. Though, we can't have environmental justice without economic justice. There's no I, I way that, that we can before. actually make sure we challenge the climate change that's going on. There's no way we can do that unless we ensure that we have a plan that actually transitions us by supporting workers. We know that this is a resource extraction province and we need to have a climate change plan that understands that. I'm the only candidate here that has a clear plan that proposes a solution towards giving just transition, not just a word, but actually a policy. We've looked at ensuring that there's investments in retraining. We've looked at ensuring that anytime there's a massive investment, that we target communities that are hardest hit with transition, and ensure that community benefit agreements will allow for local opportunities and local jobs to be created. I, I we can actually ensure this happens if we have a policy, not just slogans. What I would say is also really important is to recognize that there's a lot of people here across Western Canada uh, that, uh, you know, that live the boom and bust economy every day. I come from one of those communities, a mining town in Manitoba, and I have family in Alberta that's worked in the oil and gas sector. And people want to work in jobs that sustain their families, that sustain their communities, and they want to work in sustainable work. You know, I've had the opportunity to speak with people that are very excited about the kind of diversification that the Alberta government is investing in. But time and time again, we see this across the West, you don't have a federal government that's willing to stand up and work with us. I'm very proud that our campaign has talked about the need for public ownership when it comes to dealing with the green transition and recognizing that we can invest at the federal level and we, the people, can also benefit from those kinds of investments in order to create the good jobs of the future, good jobs that ought to be based in our communities. I, I was working before the election for the Communications, Energy and Paper Workers Union of Canada, which represented the workers uh, in the oil sands and workers in the oil and gas extraction. And despite this, my union was the first one in Canada to adopt the principles of just transition. It was a bold move by the union because obviously they recognized that we needed to go in that, in that direction and they needed to defend their workers. This is where I come from. This is why I realized that what's going on and we're seeing in Alberta right now with uh, the drop of the price of oil, having 35,000 workers who are currently unemployed, creating largely the crisis that Rachel Nutley and the Alberta government are trying to solve right now. We need to work with them. We need to ensure that uh, the union sector, and in that case, the, the Alberta Federation of Labor and the Saskatchewan Federation of Labor are involved in finding the solution and ensuring that no worker 
will be left behind when we are moving towards a transition towards an economy based on renewable. I agree. I think it's absolutely important that we make sure that our policies make sure that we don't leave anyone behind, we don't leave workers behind. If we do that, we're not going to be able to solve the climate change problems. So we need to be serious about how we ensure that workers, that farm workers, oil and gas field workers are a part of the solution, are supported, are encouraged to be a part of how we move towards a more sustainable economy. And we don't need to pit environmentalists against workers. We know that if we asked all new Democrats, do you all agree that we need to have a sustainable economy? everyone would raise, would raise their hand. I would if say we it's also them, when, if they all believe, when we're talking If they about all believe that we need to make sure that we challenge and fight climate change, they would all agree with that as well. So we need to find ways to build And when we're bridges. talking about good jobs, it means fighting for the public. Great, thank you. Now we'll have another question to all candidates and you will have 60 seconds to respond once again. The question is, off-reserve Indigenous peoples are the fastest growing segment of, of Canadian society. Winnipeg alone has over 78,000 Indigenous people living in the city. How should the federal government work to create a nation-to-nation -nation relationship that includes and respects the unique realities facing urban Indigenous peoples? Mr. Singh, you're first. Thank you. Uh, one of the things is we need to confront the Canadian legacy of genocide that has been perpetrated against the Indigenous people, both direct and cultural. We need to name systemic inequality and systemic racism. We have to call it out. It's offensive to me that we have a federal government that continues to perpetuate this myth that indigenous lives don't matter. When you have a federal government that says indigenous children don't deserve equitable funding. When you have a federal government that has contravened four compliance orders from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, it perpetuates this myth that indigenous lives don't matter. When we have policing that's discriminatory, and no one else on this stage can tell you, but it hurts when you're singled out for the color of your skin. And when you have policing that perpetuates this feeling that there's something wrong with you for being in your own community. Urban center indigenous people as well as racialized people face discrimination. I would fight that. I would ensure that we don't have that discrimination. Uh, Ms. Ashton. So first I'd say this hits close to home because many of my constituents in northern Manitoba leave third world living conditions to try and find a better life for them and their families in Winnipeg. First, we need to address those living conditions, unacceptable living conditions in reserves and First Nations across Canada, making sure that housing, education, health care are available to people. Why would you live in a home of 25 people that's mold infested? Why would you send your kid to a school that isn't a proper school with not enough textbooks or even pencils? Why would you stay there? People want to be able to live in their own communities and stay in their own communities, but the federal government legislates against that. And it, would, it is a history of colonization, a history of systemic racism that we need to put an end to. We also need to recognize that people that live in the city require a federal government that they can work with, and there needs to be proper funding of frontline services for treaty, uh, non-status, Métis people that come into uh, cities across our country. We need to work with friendship centres and everyone in making that difference. Mr. Angus. I think we have to look at the enormous potential that Canada is missing out uh, in terms of the incredible talent of this young generation. And I think of the young people who've left my communities in the north or the communities in the north uh, at 14 to live in boarding houses just to get an education. Um, that's not acceptable. But for city, the need to have a coherent housing strategy, uh, a national housing strategy. This is one of the reasons I've come forward with the uh, plan to actually hold the Trudeau government to count this fall. There's a $4 billion surplus sitting in the CMHC. Now, is Justin Trudeau going to spend that this fall on uh, rubber duckies uh, and more military adventures? Or will he be held accountable by an NDP leader to say, we need to address the housing crisis so that Indigenous youth, just like seniors, just like other people, can live with dignity because to put that potential and that support is going to transform our nation in ways we have never even imagined. Thank you, Mr. Caron. Before last election, during last election, and after last election, I kept hearing the relationship we have with indigenous peoples is the most important relationship we have. It's wind. Uh, for a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship to work, it needs to be backed by action. And unfortunately, and all of us can tell you, uh, the actions haven't followed. We're seeing the same uh, disregard for the decisions of the Human Rights Tribunal. We're seeing the same communities 
uh, stuck with the same problems of not being able to access drinkable water and the, the poor housing conditions. And politicians in Ottawa don't even need to come here in Saskatchewan to see those problems. They can just drive two hours outside of Ottawa and see them. So what we need to do as a party until the next election and after is to regain that trust. The trust that indigenous Canadians could have with their government has been, in my sense, strongly damaged and we'll need to do everything to repair that relationship and that will be by backing our words with action. We will now have yet another question and each candidate will get a chance to reply for 60 seconds. Here's the question. Since the Conservatives dismantled the Canadian Wheat Board in 2012, prairie farmers have had to contend with an unreliable, expensive rail system to transport their grain. What would you do to ensure Canadian grain farmers get the support they need to move their grain to market? Mr. Singh, you're first once again. Thank you very much. Well, first and foremost, we know that that was a horrible decision that Harper betrayed farmers by privatizing the wheat board. And we know that a majority of farmers wanted to maintain that board in the public hands, and it was something that was useful to farmers. I come from uh, a farming tradition. Both my parents were generations and generations of farmers. My uncles and aunts are all farmers. And in my opinion, if you want to have a truly free nation, that nation needs to be able to feed itself. The sovereignty of a nation depends on its ability to feed itself. And to do that, you need policies that actually support farming and support agriculture. I've, I've seen what happens when you don't support farming. My family wanted to continue to farm, but were pushed out of their farms because they didn't see a future in it. And we know that that's actually scarily a reality here in Canada, here in Saskatchewan. We know that many people want to continue with farming, but it's becoming harder and harder to do so. So we need a government that's committed to ensuring that we have a strong agriculture sector. That means policies that support it. And I would do everything in my power. To bring that um, Mr. Angus. I think one of the real strengths of what that wheat board was, it was the coming together of farmers who understood how they were being ripped off by corporate interests and they took control. Uh, and we see the attack now after the wheat board, they were done with the wheat board, the attack on supply management by the same ideological interest. Uh, to say to farmers, you shouldn't have control of your markets. Uh, we will turn it over uh, to international uh, competition that subsidized and undermine us. So when I look at the potential in the West, in the agricultural sector, the, the primary issue now is being able to get grain to market uh, that is not controlled anymore by farmers. It's a price not controlled by farmers. And so the solution, I really believe, is moving back towards a cooperative model uh, to get control of that rail line, uh, that farmers are able to buy in and share that. And I will put the investments in cooperatives because it's what always works in these situations when we come together. Mr. Caron. Yes, uh, I never understood why conservatives were so intent on protecting supply management, which is support, of course, and, and basically uh, eliminated Canadian Wheat Board and the, the, the purchasing power that producers actually had with this. And this has been, I think, a black mark on the conservative side. Uh, and one of the effects it has, besides uh, leaving individual uh, growers to the mercy of the market as individual growers, is that it, it removed their market power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the transporters, the CN and the CP. And that's been extremely problematic, especially from perspective where you have basically an industry with two companies who are dictating their terms. I can tell you that working with Malcolm Allen, who was our agriculture critic and who did amazing work to fight uh, the privatization of this, the Canadian Wheat Board, he, can tell, he could tell you that liberals and conservatives are afraid of the CNCP and they will not fight for you. Ms. Ashton. I want to begin by giving a shout out to the many people in this room who fought to keep the single desk. Many who come from farm families, who farm, who are advocates when it comes to farming. It was an honour to work with you and many in fighting for the Canadian Wheat Board. And it strikes me that the loss of the Canadian Wheat Board, the dismantling of the Canadian Wheat Board was also part of Harper's uh, agenda to make our country more and more unequal by dismantling it, taking it out of farmers' hands, and putting it in the hands of corporations, and now more recently foreign corporations, he's made the corporate sector much wealthier at the expense of everybody else. What we need is a government, a federal government, that will stand up for farmers, for farming communities, and for Canadians, and that's not what we have in Justin Trudeau either. 
whether it's in terms of the rail system, whether it's in terms of the broader discussion of, of uh, uh, you know, agricultural food sovereignty, the reality is that Canada, and particularly here in the prairies, we have what the world wants. We need to stand up for those. Thank you very much. We will now have another four-minute debate amongst all four candidates. As before, the floor is open to all of you. The question is, new Democrats who have formed government in the prairies have often been said to have their own brand of NDP policy, a populist approach rooted in prairie pragmatism. What is your view on the balance between idealism, ideology, and winning elections? So as the prairie person on this stage, I'll start by saying, I have a clear recognition that principles lead to power. I know that from my own province in Manitoba, where we've come to power, making it very clear on whose side we're on the side of working people, the side of farmers, the side of people who are squeezed to the margins on the side of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous nations. And when we talk about that reality, we need to be very clear about what we're against. Corporate greed, we're against policies that set us further and further back, we're against policies that exacerbate inequality and push us further and further to the margins. Mm -hmm. And I said it in my intro, this is a part of the country where we've dared to dream for a very long time. Tommy Douglas and consecutive NDP governments have done just that. And they've set markers for the country as a whole. But I think we need to get back to that. And so I think Canada might be ready for that brand, inspiring brand of prairie populism again. Maybe for a Western leader as well. But recognizing that we need to take on corporate greed, that we need to take on inequality, we need to take on climate change, and we need to stand up for people here in the prairies and everywhere. On this, uh, I'll, bring, I'll bring a Quebec perspective that. on this. If you, if you, just, just a quick, quick, quick Quebec perspective on this. is I often surprise people I speak to in Quebec because this brand of prairie populism and, and, and progressive politics is, is misunderstood. People don't get how people that, that in the prairies in Western Canada, people can jump from uh, NDP, vote, voting for NDP, and then voting for the Conservatives, and it happens. It's unheard of in the East because we think it jumps from you know, NDP to Liberals to Conservatives and, and vice versa. Uh, and, and that's because uh, th this is a fundamental difference we have to understand. And this makes it even more important that we are working for this country for urban Canadians and rural Canadians. And we cannot do like we did in the past, abandoning rural Canadians and not, not basically giving them away to conservatives thinking that, but you know, yeah, conservatives hope, have, have he, a monopoly he, I, I on them. You're not and saying, I hope you're not questioning the loyalty of prairie socialists. This I'm, is the I'm foundation. The this is the foundation of our party. This is the base. You are our base. You are the base of our movement. And listen, you understood something really well, that we could talk about ideas all day long. If we don't actually get to power and implement them, we're actually letting Canadians down. We're actually saying it's okay that inequality exists. If we don't form government, we're saying it's okay that people don't have a universal daycare. It's, it's like saying it's okay that we don't have a farm, farmer care. It's saying that it's okay that we don't continue Tommy's dream. Tommy's dream was to make this country a better place for all, a place where we have access to universal services publicly delivered. It's in his vision that we need to say, listen, we have to win. It's not a luxury for us. Okay, we need to win so that we can actually implement yeah, policies. The, so we need to be inspired by what you did here yeah. in the prairies and the, make sure that we win but to question, implement our principles the, to make this country a better place. The question of winning is why are we winning? The winning is making a practical difference in the lives of people. That's why we have to win. And to make that practical difference, we have to be able to tell people how we're going to do it. Because I represent working people, and they say to me, you can dream all you want because I've heard all the politicians say everything under the sun. I want to know that if you're going to say you're going to do it, you're going to get it done. That's what prairie populism is. It's about restoring that authentic relationship with Canadians that's needed right now in this age of the man who walks around with the fancy socks. That's not going to bring change. Mm -hmm. People want to have trust that if we have a plan and a bold vision, and it is a time for bold visions, but that bold vision is going to have a roadmap and people can say, I get it, I know where you're going with this, go and do it. That's just, how we win. Just to be clear, my friend Jagmeet, I've been promoting prairie populism in Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks very much. We will now have a question period segment. In this portion of the debate, each candidate will be given a chance to ask a question of another candidate. The candidate asking the question gets to choose who and what to ask, and it is not known in advance. 
They have 30 seconds to ask their question. The responding qu candidate gets 30 seconds to respond. Then the asking candidates gets 30 seconds to follow up and the respondent gets 30 seconds to conclude. Also, the questions must not simply seek agreement. and must ask for clarification or make a distinction. The first candidate to ask the question is Guy Caron. Thank you very much. Uh, Nikki, uh, you spent two years basically on the role, the role discussing the rise of precarious work, especially among young workers, and that's been incredible, incredibly important work. What I haven't heard, though, are specific proposals to tackle this problem. Uh, when I'm going to your website, you're saying my job is program as a goal of full employment, but I can't see any details. So could you share with us your solution to uh, the precarious work issue that you've, work, you've been working on for two years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I did, uh, thank you for highlighting the work that we did. Mm -hmm. We uh, did launch a national tour on the rise of precarious work in the millennial generation. And in fact, I was the first uh, member of parliament to talk about this very issue at the national level. And um, what I said, it requires a comprehensive approach. And yes, that requires a good jobs program. You know, we've got a number of jobs programs already that we need to extend with a vision of full employment. But we also need to look at free tuition. We need to look at expanding the social safety net further. Uh, we need to look at making sure there's affordable housing. Yeah. What, I'm not really hearing a plan here. I'll give you another chance because it's crucial that we have a plan. We're going to face a Trudeau who uh, spoke well. He said all the right words, but he is not following this with action. Uh, we will regain the trust of progressives by having a clear agenda. I'm proposing, for example, to eliminate poverty and address precarious work with a basic income program. What is your proposal to address this in terms of a plan? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have to, we can't be simplistic about this. This, the rise of precarious work is a result of political and economic policies that have gotten us here, like privatization, like austerity, like bad trade deals. So I think we need to be clear that this is a systemic uh, cause that's brought us here. And as a result, there need to be comprehensive approaches. I don't think basic annual income will solve the crisis of precarious work. We do need good jobs in our communities, and we need to make sure that young people are able to achieve a quality of life uh, that, that is dignified. And right now, more and more concerned. Um, Ms. Ashton, it's your turn to ask a question. My question is to Jagmeet Singh. Coming from the prairies, I know we share many common values here in our region, but we also disagree on some issues at times. When you came out with your position on pipelines, you said, and I quote, the pipeline debate too often descends into Alberta bashing. I was taken aback by this statement. My question to you is, who were you referring to? Was it one of the candidates, one of our campaigns? Was it a specific New Democrat? Thank you for the question. I think that it's something that really troubles me that we have a premier that's, that's fought hard for climate change, but is also trying to understand the reality of her province. There's workers that rely on jobs that are in the oil and, and gas industry. And people that are attacking Rachel Notley don't acknowledge that she has such a, a difficult position to balance. And uh, I've seen that too often. I've seen an attack by, by people in general that, that, doesn't, that pits workers against environmentalists, that Ms. seeks Ashton. to divide our party. So I'm concerned, first of all, I, I didn't hear exactly who you were referring to, but I'm concerned that that's a kind of divisive language that uh, doesn't help any of us. Uh, for us new, as New Democrats, the solution is not to divide ourselves one region against the next. We've seen that from the right, and that's not how we do things. It is about working together, even if we do have disagreements. And here on the prairies, I've been proud to work with so many in Alberta and in Saskatchewan uh, to build a party. I'm a fan of a lot of the work the Notley government has been doing, and we need to work, yes, through disagreements, but work yeah, what I've heard too often, though, is people attacking our party and trying to seek to divide our party, and that's not acceptable to me. And that's why I said we don't need to, to launch our position on an energy project by attacking someone like Rachel Notley. And that's why I didn't couch my climate change plan in just an energy project. I think that's offensive, and that disrespects the climate change that's such an important issue. And we need to have an actual climate change plan, which you don't have, Nikki. That's what you need to have if you want to really talk about uh, how we fight climate change. Um, Mr. Angus. Thank you. Um, we lost four young people last week in Northern Ontario. We're losing them every day. Um, we've lost them here in Saskatchewan. Uh, Guy, I've got enormous respect for you, but I haven't seen anything on your plan about Indigenous people and First Nations. And I want to say in the House in November, if you're leader, what are you going to do to respond to this brutal crisis of us losing young people day after day across this country? I'm actually glad that you asked me this question because I've 
greatly admire the work that you've done in the advocacy you had for First Nations, and I had the chance for, I would say, over half of my parliamentary life to sit next to Romeo Saganash, who's also an inspiring figure, uh, and I learned so much under Romeo. I will have an Indigenous Issues platform that will come out before the end of this campaign, that's for sure, but I will have a chance to, re to rebut eventually, but I will say that we need to reverse the damage that the Liberals are currently doing to this country. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate that all platforms are not out there. The question in terms of how we start to tell a young generation that are giving up hope at 9 and 10 that they, their lives matter to us is, is key to me. It is the fundamental question of our time as New Democrats that we can reach out to that young generation and say, we're not going to lose any more kids on our watch. So what would you do uh, to address that? Because I don't think we can let this go on. We have to show that kind of leadership. We'll need to have significant investments that will be made to fulfill the commitments, the promises that we have made to Indigenous Canadians. And that goes into fixing the problems that we are seeing in their communities, be it drinkable water, housing, and so many other problems. Uh, we'll need to respect the decisions of the tribunals and not even have to go and fight those decisions in the tribunals the way we're doing it right now. And I do believe that to build that true relationship, we will need to, to go over and above what Liberals have done. It's not only promising these, but telling how it will be done. Mr. Singh. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Guy. Like all New Democrats, I believe we need universal public social services like medical care, like pharma care, like daycare. I also believe as New Democrats, we have a responsibility to fight poverty. In order to fight poverty, we need income transfers, where the wealthy and those who can invest a little more, invest that bit more to lift Canadians out of poverty. But based on the last debate, it seems to me, Guy, you don't believe in fighting poverty. Why are you purposely conflating universal programs with income transfers? And why don't you believe in redistribution? I'm not sure where that comes from. <laughs> I, I, I proposed, uh, and that was clear from the beginning, a plan to eliminate poverty in this country. And we have to work. It's not a, a panacea per se. It's not something that, that needs to be on its own. And I'm talking, of course, of basic income. It will go on with a fight towards a $15 an hour minimum wage and greater transfers to uh, the provinces for uh, social programs and for healthcare. So all of this is complementary, but basic income is uh, a very promising way to eliminate poverty. Guy, you attacked me on redistribution last time, but, but both you and I know that your entire basic income guarantee proposal is income tested and that OAS is already clawed back for those who earn over 70000 You seem a little inconsistent on your position. I strongly believe in universal public social programs. I also believe in fighting poverty with redistribution. Redistribution isn't universal. Why don't you have the courage to ask our fellow Canadians who can invest a bit more to invest that to lift Canadians out of poverty? I think you're confusing two things there. The first uh, is when I talked about your policy on old age security, is that you're taking a program that's near universal and you want to make it means tested. I'm proposing to create a new program, not take an existing one, to create a new program through the tax system that will allow for the elimination of poverty. That's the point. So it's not income tested, as you're saying, it's income based to ensure that the objective to eliminate poverty is addressed through the tax system. I'm not taking a program and make it. Excellent. We'll now have our one question in French for this debate. It is intended that the candidates answer the question in the language it is asked, but that is not mandatory. Candidates will have 60 seconds to respond. I'd like to welcome Guillaume Francoeur to ask the question. Merci, Tria. Alors, nous allons passer à la seule question en français de ce débat, et les candidats auront 60 secondes chacun pour répondre. Selon vous, y a-t-il un secteur de l'économie ou un service en particulier qui performerait mieux s'il devenait de propriété publique? Monsieur Caron, vous êtes le premier. Euh, oui, en fait, euh, je pense qu'en ce qui est trait à l'investissement en infrastructure, présentement, le gouvernement fédéral en particulier ne répond pas à ses, euh, ses promesses. Il avait promis des investissements massifs en infrastructure. En fait, on était supposé être en déficit pour financer des infrastructures et au bout du compte, on est en plus grand déficit et on a financé très peu d'infrastructures. Et on s'en va vers une banque d'infrastructures qui va être une banque de privatisation, qui va privatiser ces infrastructures-là et qui va les prioriser selon leur rendement et non pas selon les besoins des communautés. Alors, si le gouvernement n'arrive pas à prendre la bonne décision, nous devrons prendre la bonne décision en ce qui a trait à, aux infrastructures. Et une proposition que je trouve extrêmement séduisante, c'est celle de créer une société d'État qui va être 
dont, dont, dont le mandat sera d'émettre de, 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 des obligations spécifiquement pour les investissements en infrastructure. Et je pense que c'est extrêmement positif pour l'avenir et ça va éliminer la, le besoin. Parfait, merci. Madame Ashton. Je dirais que, en fait, notre campagne a déjà proposé euh, euh, la propriété publique, les sociétés d'État dans trois euh, secteurs qui sont importants de notre économie. Euh, le secteur bancaire, on a mis de l'avant une propos sur le, une banque postale, reconnaissant que oui, il faut s'attaquer euh, à, à la corporatisation dans ce secteur et il faut donner l'opportunité aux Canadiens de, de pouvoir utiliser ces services euh, d'une façon que, où on, on, on bénéficie aussi. Euh, aussi, en termes de santé, on a proposé une société d'État euh, qui s'occupe de l'achat des médicaments et ensuite euh, euh, le partage de ces médicaments. Euh, bien sûr, ce serait en transition avec un système de médicaments, Pharmacare, qu'on dit. Et finalement, une société d'État qui peut s'occuper de l'investissement dans une transition verte, reconnaissant que le gouvernement fédéral doit montrer du leadership dans ce domaine et ça peut se faire à, à, à travers d'une société d'État. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur Singh. Merci beaucoup. Euh, C'est très clair qu'on a besoin de, des investissements dans, dans, le, dans le, notre infrastructure. C'est très clair qu'on a besoin de faire ça. Mais je suis tellement d'accord avec euh, Monsieur Caron quand il a dit que les banques d'infrastructures que le gouvernement propose maintenant, c'est seulement une banque de privatisation. C'est tellement clair. Et on n'a on, on a pas besoin de ça. On a besoin d'avoir des services publics. On a besoin de créer des, des infrastructures publiques. Et euh, j'ai proposé quelques euh, idées. Une idée, on a beaucoup d'énergie qu'on crée qui est verte, mais il est dans des provinces comme Québec et euh, Manitoba. Mais si on a un système fédéral, public, où on peut euh, créer un système d'électrification national, ça c'est un exemple de façon de lutter contre le changement climatique et d'avoir un système national pour l'électricité. Merci. Monsieur Angus c'est clair maintenant, le gouvernement de M. Trudeau euh, a lancé une attaque contre euh, les investissements publics, particulièrement avec ces banques d'infrastructure. Et regardez la situation avec Ontario maintenant et la privatisation des hydro, ce n'est pas acceptable. Et pour les, euh, pour les banques d'infrastructure, en réalité, c'est un club select des investisseurs et des amis de M. Morneau et la gang dans Bay Street. Je vais arrêter ces fonds-là immédiatement. C'est essentiel pour notre pays de maintenir le contrôle et le développement de l'infrastructure publique. La situation avec ce gouvernement-là maintenant est le manque de transparence et ces plans vont bénéficier, bénéficier à les multinationales et les amis des partis libéraux. Ce n'est pas acceptable. Je vais Attaquer ce problème. Thank you very much. We'll now have another question for open debate amongst all of you, this time for two and a half minutes. The question is, most Canadians don't have a workplace pension, and many are worried that the Canada Pension Plan won't be enough to meet their needs. Many Canadians are turning towards two private tools for their retirement, registered retirement savings plans and tax-free savings account. Should there be a change to the limits people can invest in these tools? Well, right off the bat, we have the privatized pension king of Canada, Bill Morneau, who's going mm -hmm. after what's left of the defined pension plans. Uh-uh. You need a leader in the House this November to take on Bill Morneau and say he's not going to undermine what's left of the pension system. And for the people who are not having pensions now, we need, as a new democratic government, to make that a priority, that all the contract workers, the people who are being downsized, have access. And look at Sears. That is not going to happen on my watch that a corporate hedge fund operator gets to rip off the workers at Sears. We're going to put a stop to that. But I would also say, Charlie, it's, uh, it's not enough to say we're just going to fight Bill Morneau, which I'm totally with you on. I mean, this is a guy who He's made good. his career <laughs> out of uh, uh, m uh, screwing people's pensions, basically. Uh, but what we need to do is put forward a plan uh, that takes on the rich and powerful in our country overall. And it's a plan, it's a plan that uh, I'm very proud to have put for it as part of our team, a tax reform plan for a just society, recognizing that yes, people are turning to other, mo other modes of saving their money, but who's doing most of that? It's the rich. 
42% of the benefits of tax loopholes are going to the rich, and it's the middle class and working people that are paying the price, many of whom are seeing their CPP dwindling, many of whom don't have a workplace pension or any sort of retirement security to depend public, on. Public Our plan pensions. is put forward, yeah. uh, not, let's, yes, let's fighting that, but candidate. also proposing. I, I agree with Nikki that, uh, that uh, private pensions are not the way to go. They are a lot more costly in terms of their administrative costs. I mean, how many of you have the chance to save $26,000 a year to put in your RSPs? There is no way you can do it. Uh, so what we need to do is to improve uh, the protection that we can afford, especially through public pensions, and ensure that our people will uh, have retirement with dignity. We, we also need to make sure. <clears throat> we also need to make sure that we don't just have a progressive tax reform, which I acknowledge Nikki does, but we actually have to link that to poverty reduction. So I propose a plan, a Canada Seniors Guarantee. This is a plan that will actually lift seniors out of poverty, will provide some income security to seniors. We need to make sure that people who spent their entire lives building our country, giving back to society, have the ability to retire with respect and dignity. So I have a plan that's fully funded, that's costed, that'll ensure that, that seniors, given the context where we don't see public pensions, are receiving the supports they need, the dignity they deserve, and they will live in a way that they can enjoy their, their retirement. Thanks everyone, that is our full two and a half minutes. We will now have another question and you'll each have a chance to reply for 60 seconds. Here's the question. Despite an overall decrease in the crime rate over the last two decades, many Canadians say they don't feel safe in their own communities. How do you think the government should improve public safety and deal with those convicted of serious crimes? And Mr. Caron, you have the first response. Uh, we have to deal seriously with, uh, with those crimes, but we have to acknowledge the limitations of what were conservatives led us in the past. Uh, when you're going to try to make people feel safe by making this, the justice system very inefficient and very costly, we're all losing in the end. I think we have a very good system. People need to know that we have a very good system and that uh, we have men in uniform, uh, police officers, who uh, are, uh, by and large, ensuring our protection. But we need to ensure that uh, the, uh, the protection that we have in our neighborhood and the, uh, the, not only the, 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 the enforcement sector, but also the justice sector will be there for each, and, and, uh, each of us. Uh, we need to ensure that the victims uh, will be listened to. We need to ensure that they will have a place in the room, not only during the trial, but also after. And we need to ensure that uh, the community will uh, be all, in, all encompassing in those. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Angus. Well, uh, in my 20s, my wife and I took in men coming out of prison uh, to try and reintegrate them. And it was a real education in life. Um, and what we learned from that is so much of the recidivism and crime is from people who are ending up on the streets without housing, uh, who are ending up without the support for dealing with drug addiction, which is a very uh, major driver of this. And so we actually need to talk about putting those investments in, in terms of housing right now, the, the lack of a housing strategy, of dealing with the fact that many people who are stuck on fentanyl or oxy cannot get the treatment that they need and they follow back into this. But in terms of serious crime, yes, we have to take that seriously and we cannot diminish it. We have to make sure that the police have the resources that they need and we have to have it in our communities. So first I'd say that we need to, uh, it's important to recognize that violent crime has gone down in our country, but you wouldn't know it from the last nine years of government of Stephen Harper. He made us all feel more unsafe and he marginalized communities while doing it. I think it's very important that we look at true justice reform and repealing the, legislate, the kind of legislation that Har the Harper government put forward, that the Trudeau government has still to repeal, that marginalizes indigenous and racialized peoples in our country. We need to recognize that the vulnerabilities that exist are very much linked to poverty and the lack of housing. We need to expand the social safety net to put, lift people up so that they all, we all feel secure in our communities. Access to housing, access to health care, pharma care, dental care, these are the kinds of things. Access to an education, and including tuition-free education as we've put forward, recognizing that we need to lift everybody up. And yes, supporting harm reduction policies in communities and cities across our country. That's the way forward. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you very much. So first off, Canadians absolutely deserve to be safe. But we've been sold a false choice. 
Many people, when they talk about public safety, say that you have to choose between civil liberties and public security. That's a false choice. We can have both. We can be safe and protect our civil, civil liberties. When it comes to criminal justice system, we know that a certain model has failed. The model of mass incarceration is a model of the states. It doesn't work. It actually doesn't reduce crime. Instead, we need to overhaul our criminal justice system towards a rehabilitative model. Sure, and we need to acknowledge there are some people that are so dangerous to society and to themselves, they might need to be kept separate. But for the most part, what we need to do is invest in ways to rehabilitate people. Instead of criminalizing addicts or the poor, we need to provide harm reduction in ways to move away from criminalization. We need to move away from mass incarceration and provide supports to people. That's the way we build a safer and secure society. Great, thank you very much. We will now have a couple lightning round questions. I will ask two of these questions and each candidate will get just 15 seconds to respond. The first question is, would you reintroduce the gun registry? Charlie Angus, you are first. Um, I wouldn't have spent a billion dollars putting that thing in, but I wouldn't have spent a billion, I wouldn't have burnt a billion dollars worth of records. No, if we're gonna spend a billion dollars, I'd put that into public safety. That's what I would do on the gun registry. Um, Ms. Ashton. I think it's important that we have smart policy and we know uh, that the registry uh, certainly wasn't, wasn't that and, and what we need is to make sure that regions across the country, provinces be able uh, to decide what's best for them, uh, recognizing there are different dynamics across our country. Uh, Mr. Singh. That's a difficult question, absolutely. I know that's why it's asked. I think it's uh, also important that we acknowledge regional differences, uh, the fact that there is a, a different culture between the uh, way things are treated in different regions and then that's important to acknowledge. Uh, Mr. Caron. I guess I'm glad we moved away from the what's your favorite political movie. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a tough question, but I would not reintroduce it. I think there are ways to ensure public safety that uh, would be less costly. And we have seen that the federal government just hasn't been able to manage this file. Thank you very much. The second question is, would you keep Justin Trudeau in power to prevent Andrew Scheer from becoming the prime minister? <laughs> uh, and Nikki Ashton, you are first. So I feel 15 seconds is not enough for this question. <laughs> But uh, look, I'll be very clear. I think uh, the way Canada is shifting, the, the only uh, option for Canadians to take on the issues of our time is voting NDP. And that would be my number one goal in fighting against Trudeau and uh, Mr. Caron. Oh, um, it's, it's clear that uh, to me, uh, Liberals are acting a lot like Conservatives right now. This is what we'll need to do to convince or to demonstrate Canadians that they wanted to vote for progressive politics because they are progressives, but Liberals uh, Mr. Singh. The reality is both liberals and conservatives are status quo parties. They're parties of institutions. They are not going to actually eradicate poverty, deal with inequality. So neither of them are actually going to be the solution. We are the only solution to making this just Canada more. Uh, Mr. Angus. I didn't get into politics to carry the plates for the liberal dinner. And I'm not going to sit here in our debate and say, oh, well, we would help the Liberals. No, we are going to be a social democratic government because our values are what's needed in this country. Great. Thank you, everyone. Here's another question for all of you to debate for two and a half minutes. The Regina Manifesto, which was adopted by the founding convention of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation in 1933, launched the forerunner of the modern NDP. What's one piece of that vision that hasn't yet been realized that you think remains relevant and a priority today? Government. <laughs> I mean, that's the, it's, it is a brilliant manifesto, but we have not formed a federal government. And that's the task before us. Simple. So I would say the Regina Manifesto and much of the work that the CCF did talked openly about a socialist vision of our country talked openly about the need for to put people before profit. And that is a vision that I think we need to get back to in a bigger way, given the kinds of challenges we're facing in this country. A kind of growth and inequality, the likes we haven't seen in generations. Climate change, catastrophic climate change. And recognizing that that means putting people before profit. That means calling for fundamental change. And I'm proud to be a part of a campaign, the only campaign that is calling for fundamental change and challenging those, the rich and powerful, Powerful, like the ones that the Reg Regina Manifesto and the CCF called out uh, to say that we deserve better here in, across our country. 
I, I wouldn't say that you're the only one. I think Guy's calling them out. I'm calling them out. I'm not sure about Charlie, though, but the rest of us are definitely calling them out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just joking, Charlie. Uh, but, in reality, <laughs> but in reality, one of the major things I'll that Manifesto asks for, of fame. one of the, mani yeah. the main things is that how can we tackle inequality and create a more equal and just society? That we've not seen. In fact, what we've seen is we've moved further and further away from that vision, from that dream, that dream of a society where we could all realize our own potential. Each of us could find ways to earn a decent living and build a future for ourselves and our children. We're moving away further and further as we see inequality get broader and broader and wider and wider. We're seeing that less people have an opportunity to make a life in this country. See, when I was saying that I was praising prairie populism in Quebec, that's because of the region, largely because of the Regina Manifesto. Uh, I think we have, to, we have to look at what it accomplished also. I mean, the, the, the successful push of the CCF in, in pushing governments federally and even provincially to move towards EI, to move towards uh, social assistance, to move towards pensions, uh, all of this came from that vision that was, that was built. I agree with Charlie, the fact is, federally we were not able to govern, and one thing that we should be implementing, uh, and remember that was in 1933, we're in a world that's very different from there, is that vision that can encompass uh, and break down the solid hues that we have among the different regions in the country. Prairie populism is something that we to be proud about and to export, but we need to ensure that all the barriers between our regions are. Uh, thank you very much, candidates. You're doing great so far. Um, here's another question, which you'll each get 60 seconds to reply. Looking at the Sanders and Corbyn campaigns and others, how do you think we can get more NDP members excited and engaged in the su to support the party? Guy Caron, you are up first. We need passion. We need to be able to improvise, uh, to improvise, to inspire, and to improvise at times, yes. <laughs> we, need, we need to be able to express what the vision of a social democratic Canada would be in 5, 10, 15 years. For this, we need to have the leaders, yes, but it's not only a matter of charisma. It's also a matter of bringing forward the policies that will make people dream, but dream in a way that they can see this future possible. Uh, so when we're looking at, at uh, Jeremy Carbon and Bernie Sanders, they also had one thing that we need to have as NDP leaders, and that's something I see lacking right now with the current prime minister, which is authenticity. This is how they were able to, to gain the trust of people, to, gain, to, to create that, that moment in the UK and the US was by, by being themselves, by, by being true to their nature and by bringing people to, to believe in their dream. And we'll need to do the same thing as, uh, as the next election is coming. And this is what I want to do also to bring election. Thanks very much. Now we'll hear from Mrs. Ashton. Well, first I'd say uh, it would be good to talk about what Sanders and Corbyn have done. And I'm proud to be the candidate that probably talks about that the most. And I think what, what's important is that we not just look at the rhetoric they use, but we look at the ideas they're putting forward, because they are putting forward tangible ideas, principled ideas, like free ta tuition, like fair taxation and tax taxing, t uh, taking on the uh, tax system that is rigged. They're talking about public ownership. They're talking about fundamental change. And they're talking about it because people in countries around the world, in the US, in the UK, are facing growing inequality, not unlike what we're facing here. They're also working with social movements, social movements that are pushing forward on these values every single day. And I want to recognize the incredible activism that's taking place here in Saskatchewan, whether it's the students mobilize against cuts, whether it's those that fought for the STC, whether it's those that are fighting for, for SaskTel, recognizing that you are on the front lines of the fight for environmental justice, economic justice. Uh, thank you very much. And next up, we have Mr. Angus. I think there are moments in our nation's history when we on the left have to step up because we have seen so much of what has been built uh, by our parents and our grandparents being undermined by this promise. You know, Justin Trudeau and, and, and Cretchen and Martin and Stephen Harper, you know, they told us, well, we'll reduce the corporate tax rate and it'll create investment, it'll create jobs, we'll get these free trade agreements, you'll be citizens of the world. And what it was, was set up to strip the ability of our communities, the ability of workers to make decisions, to, to be able to move capital wherever it wants. It's, as Chesterton said, the, the pursuit of the horrible mysticism of money. So what do we do like with Corbin and Sanders? We offer that vision that this is time where we start to draw the line in the sand. Where we're gonna to say to corporate Canada, 
you're going to pay more because you're not, you've broken the social contract. We are going to reinvest in people and we will make a commitment because across political lines, people... Thank you very much. And finally, we'll hear from Mr. Singh. Thank you. We are the only party that has the courage to tackle the most important issues that our country is facing. Inequality, climate change, reconciliation. We are the only ones that can do it. But the issue is, is that you are our base and you are the foundation of our movement. If we want to do this, we need to use your energy, your passion, and grow our party. There's no other way to do it. We need to grow our party. We need to reach out to people that have never been members before. We need to make sure we engage people who share our values but just don't know it yet. We don't need slogans that are empty and not based on a policy. We need to provide them with passionate ideas backed up with policies to show them how we can achieve it. We need to engage people in urban centers across this country, by rem but also remembering that we need to continue to engage the rural and all parts of our country. We need to build a movement that grows our membership, that adds in new volunteers and new members. I can do that for us. Well done, everyone. Thank you very much. Now we will have another question period segment. As before, each candidate will have 30 seconds to ask a question of another candidate. The respondent gets 30 seconds to reply, then the asking candidate will get an additional 30 seconds to follow up, where, and then the respondent will get another 30 second conclusion. Candidates mu must not ask a question of the same candidate they asked in the first question period. The first, the first question goes to Jagmeet Singh. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. My question is to Charlie. Charlie, we need to win back seats in major cities across the country. We've been blocked out entirely of a region like Toronto. Under my leadership, the NDP can win seats not only in urban cities and centres, but in surrounding suburbs as well. What is your plan for a path to governing in 2019? Well, I'm really glad that question's been asked because I've done the work on the ground of building the teams with Jack Layton where we run right across northern Ontario and we did that by putting organizers on the ground. Now, I know there's people in our party, small group, who believe that you can run our party from a, a group in Ottawa with their organizers there. Uh-uh. We're going to put the organizers back on the ground. We're not going to be treating our base as though you just get the message box from that little group in Ottawa. We will rebuild the movement here, and that's our path to victory in every region of our country in 2019. I haven't really heard how your plan to gaining winning back seats in urban centres. I'm confident that I can help grow our party in new seats and ridings that the Liberals have held for decades. I can do this because I can connect with new Canadians in ways that others on the stage simply cannot. What will you do for the party that's different than what we've been doing before for years? Well, I think that's a really good question because uh, if I look at where we've won, we've won by putting the organizers on the ground not by having someone come in and say, I can do this all myself. That's been the problem with that central team, that little group in Ottawa that says, you know what, we're going to get a big image, we're going to get a big spin, and we're all going to win. That's what Liberals do. That's not what New Democrats do. So what will I do? I will put those uh, organizers on the ground in Toronto, not in Ottawa. I will put them on the ground in Moose Jaw, not in Ottawa, and I will put them on the ground across... Thank you, both of you. The next question goes to Mr. Caron. Pour continuer sur la même lancée, Charlie, euh, un Québécois sur quatre a voté pour nous en 2015 et on a 16 excellents députés. Je t'ai posé la question à Saint-Jean. Il n'y a aucun doute que notre succès euh, en 2019 va passer par une croissance de nos appuis au Québec. On ne pourra pas gagner sans avoir une bonne présence au Québec. Euh, je t'ai demandé à ce moment-là qu'est-ce que tu ferais comme chef pour augmenter nos appuis au Québec. J'ai trouvé la réponse un peu vague, un peu générale. Alors, est-ce que tu pourrais, as-tu eu la chance d'y réfléchir puis d'affiner ta pensée? On a gagné en 2011 grâce à le travail dur de Jack avec les bénévoles et les mouvements progressistes au Québec. Et le problème en 2015 était la plateforme électorale euh, pour les Québécois. C'était très faible. Pour moi, comme leader, je vais travailler avec le, 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 le caucus extraordinaire de notre équipe, euh, parti et aussi de travailler avec les mouvements pour développer le plan ensemble. Je crois, fondamentalement que, je crois fondamentalement que la priorité du nouveau chef sera en fait de ne pas être si souvent que ça à Ottawa, puis d'être vraiment sur le terrain, à l'extérieur du Québec et au Québec aussi. Il va falloir aller à la rencontre des gens. Il va falloir s'assurer qu'on ne soit pas juste à Montréal, mais aussi en Mauricie, qu'on soit en Abitibi, qu'on soit au Saguenay, au lac Saint-Jean, en Estrie, pour reconnecter avec les Canadiens puis les Québécois. Euh, 
Au niveau d'une plateforme, je suis d'accord. Est-ce que tu as des éléments précis présentement qui devraient être inclus dans une plateforme québécoise pour attirer? Euh... C'est une bonne question. Pour moi, essentiel pour les NPD de respecter les juridictions québécoises, les valeurs québécoises et aussi l'importance de la langue française pour l'identité euh, des, des, des Québécoises. Je représente en région proche de Abitibi Temeskemeng, donc je suis très euh, impliqué avec les, les communautés dans cette région-là. Mais pour moi, je dois travailler avec la base à Québec. Thank you very much. Ms. Ashton, you're next. My question is to you, Guy. This debate is taking place here in Saskatchewan where people are dealing with massive austerity. Uh, one of the major ongoing concerns is in Saskatchewan is the high levels of post-secondary tuition, the second highest in Canada. My position has been clear. Education is a right, and it is time to stop indebting generations of young people for simply getting what we expect of them, an education. It's time to eliminate tuition fees, and we've said that. I know you haven't made your position clear. I'm wondering where you stand on tuition. Well, I used to be the chairperson of the Canadian Federation of Students, and I was fighting for free tuition, and my position hasn't changed. Uh, what I want to do for students, first and foremost, and I'm doing it through this basic income proposal, is to give them immediate help and assistance. If you're going and moving towards free tuition, which we need to do, we'll need to sit down with provinces for negotiations, because that will require transfers. Uh, it won't be automatic, and it will take five, maybe 10 years to negotiate. I want to be able to help them now, and they will be able to access uh, basic income. But wouldn't you agree that it's important for us going forward to have a clear position, one that echoes what we're hearing from the Canadian Federation mm -hmm. of Students, from the labor movement, from many activists across our country who are recognizing that if we're going to take on intergenerational inequality, part of that means uh, committing to tuition-free education. At a time when two-thirds of jobs in our country require a post-secondary education, it's simply not a choice. It's something young people have to do. So, while you, so the question is, will you support that bold idea right off the get-go? Well, this is what I said. I said I'm in favor of free tuition, and I'm in favor of free tuition after I'm able to implement basic income, because we can do basic income for all Canadians to eliminate poverty, but this Money will actually be available, these funds will be available to students immediately. So I'll do that first and I'll prioritize that. And after we can move and negotiate free tuition. The problem we have right now, if we don't do anything else, and we don't know how long those negotiations will take, I don't want students to just benefit from something in five, ten years. Let's do something now. Thank you to both of you. Up next, Mr. Angus. Thank you. Well, there's one of the things that some people in the party tell us, if we act more like liberals, we'll win. And one of the areas where the liberals have attacked us is on our belief in the universality and basic programs. And Mr. Singh, uh, you're telling us that applying a means test to the old age pension is a progressive idea because it's about your idea of redistribution. Universality of old age pension is one of our fundamental principles. It's a new Democratic Party principle. Why would you take a position that liberals and conservatives would alike? Uh, first of all, it's old age security that I'm talking about. And old age security is not universal right now. So you need to do some research. Uh, right now, if you earn more than 70000 it's already clawed back. So I guess you need to double-check your facts. Uh, I believe that right now, we have a responsibility to stand up for redistribution. People have wealth, and they need to give that wealth to those, they need to transfer that wealth to those who are living in poverty right now. That's a fundamental principle. Income transfers are very different than social programs. I believe in universal, publicly delivered health care, pharma care, daycare. Oh, thank you. Well, I guess I'll, I'll do the research, but the way income transfers work with seniors that I know, a widow, her husband, her, a woman, her husband dies, and she has to cash a bond to pay for his funeral, and her pension gets clawed back. That, to me, is the indignity of what right-wing economics does, that we should be protecting old-age security, and that, those should be that we should be putting that as our highest priority here in Saskatchewan, of all places. How could you call a means test redistribution? Uh, it is. Uh, it's the definition. If someone's earning a million dollars a year, they don't need a thousand dollars a month. That person should be contributing to people that are living in poverty. It's offensive to me that millionaires or people earning over hundred thousand dollars are receiving payment when people are living in poverty right now. We should end poverty and we can. I have a plan that actually will lift seniors out of poverty immediately. And I'm committed to that plan. Um, I saw two cards, so uh, first up, Mr. Caron, and then uh, Mr. Angus. 
I got one left. It's still, it's, it's, no. it's, still, it's still NDP policy to fight for universality of programs. Old age security, the NDP was at the forefront of fighting against the end of uh, universality for old age security and family allowances. Our policy hasn't changed. We should still fight for universality of those programs. And it's not because we have the wealthy banker's wife, as Linda McQuig wrote, that should be, uh, we, we should be not looking at establishing programs that are the birthright of, of Canadians. We should ensure that we have those programs uh, so that everybody will enjoy them and, and not buy into the liberal and... Thank you, Mr. Angus. You're talking about people who make a million dollars when I'm talking about widows who are going to be having their savings clawed back because they have to cash bonds to pay for a funeral. It's the indignities of what's treated to seniors. And you, my friend, when you make it seem as if this is a great progressive idea, well, where I come from, that's not progressive. Seniors fought for that. Seniors should have that protected. And that, to me, is a fundamental principle of New Democratic Party values in this country. Okay, Mr. Singh, you raise your card. Let's just make this clear. Seniors earning over 70000 already see their OAS clawed back. It is not universal. And what we need to do right now is ensure that we have a program that helps low and middle income seniors. I stand behind that. I stand fundamentally in favor of redistribution. But we need to not conflate the two ideas. Universal public program, programs like health care, daycare, pharma care should be universal and publicly accessed. But income transfer can only go one way, from the rich to the poor. I believe in that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, here is another question to all of you for a one-minute response. The question is, what influence does your faith have on your political agenda? Hikaron, you are first. Uh, uh, I grew up as a Catholic in, uh, in Rimouski, and I'll tell you that this, the community it gave us, I, I'm less practicing now, but it gave me a sense of community, it gave me a sense of generosity as well, and of belonging. Uh, my parents instilled in me the necessity of always working for others, and that's something that we live through the church, and that's something that we live on a personal basis as well. Uh, I do believe that in public life, uh, religion and, and the state should be separate in that sense. What we need to have is actually a strong sense of morals. We need to do the right thing. We need to do it. F and I, I, we're all here in, as New Democrats because I think there is a value that we all share, which is that governments should be there for all of us for the common good, to help each other, to, to, to stand in solidarity with each other, and only government can, can bring about this force for good. This is something I learned with the family and with the church from the uh, earliest stage. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Angus, you are next. I love that line that we are called to be the restorer of the broken streets and the rebuilder of communities to live in. And I think that that's a fundamental principle. But I do believe that as, uh, a secular party, we have to have some, some lines in the sand because I was excommunicated from my church. I was denounced from the pulpit and I was told that the diocese would have me defeated in the next election because I stood up on the principle of the right of same-sex couples who love each other to marry because those are civil rights and I will protect those rights. And my family faced an enormous pressure from that. My aunts in the convent faced enormous pressure but it was a fundamental principle of who we are, is that we stand up for those civil rights and I will never allow any uh, priest, religious leader whatsoever to try and influence the work of what we do representing civil society. So I will stand with my faith, but I will stand with my party on civil rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mr. Singh, you are next. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been guided by my mom really when it comes to my spiritual beliefs. And she inspired me with much of what I believe in today. So from the spirituality that my mom taught me, the sixth spirituality, uh, we believe that there's a, an energy that we all share, one energy between all of us. And that energy connects us to one another, but also connects us to the planet. So when I stand up for issues like uh, same-sex marriage, I come from a position where I believe that we all deserve equal rights. When I talk about the women's right to choose, it comes from the position that we need to stand up for the rights of women. In fact, one of the interesting things about uh, the turban, the turban was an act of rebelliousness where it was banned for people who were not royal. Only royalty could wear a turban. And in our tradition, we believe that men and women were equally royal, had equal access to rights, and so we wore a turban as a symbol of rebellion that all people deserve to be free and have uh, justice. 
And a lot of these values were exactly what drew me to the New Democratic Party, to social democracy, to justice, that we need to stand up for the rights of all people. We need to see the connection between all of us. And if we hurt the planet, we hurt ourselves. So I found this synergy between my beliefs. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, next up, Miss Ashton. Well, first, I think it's important here in Saskatchewan to recognize that the history of the CCF is intertwined with many uh, that uh, were driven by their faith. In fact, one of the first places we visited on this tour and as part of the leadership was Weyburn and had a meeting at the, in the basement of the church that Tommy Douglas preached in. I could talk a bit about my own personal story and uh, my connection to the Greek Orthodox Church through my mom, uh, but my drive and my commitment as a New Democrat comes from a fundamental sense of fighting for justice and that's something that I believe is truly universal when we talk about the need to fight for justice alongside those who face so much injustice, whether it's indigenous communities, whether it's the LGBTQ community, whether it's immigrant and racialized communities, whether it's women, and recognizing that often religious beliefs have been used to marginalize people, to oppress, and, uh, and that that is something that we need to recognize in our history and we need to move forward. Recognizing that, that in order for reconciliation to happen, we need to call out that history in order for us to move forward toward equality. We need to stand up for that. Um, we will now have one last question, and you will each get just over a minute to respond. <laughs> Here's the question. Would you abolish the sen Senate? And if so, how would you get it done? Nikki Ashton, you are first. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm proud that uh, uh, Flim Flon, actually, the uh, community on the border of, of Manitoba and Saskatchewan, I remember there was some uh, graffiti a few years ago in the height of the Mike Duffy scandal, which said uh, right on the side of, the, of this building on the main drag, abolish the Senate. So this is where we come from. We believe in abolishing the Senate. But to be quite honest, I mean, you know, it is, uh, it is an institution that uh, is, uh, is a reflection of, of, uh, of liberal and conservative cultures of, of, of greed. Uh, it is an institution that has no place in Canada. And we need to move forward towards proportional representation and recognizing how we make sure that our voices as Canadians are truly reflected at the political level and in the house of, of the people. That's something that's, uh, that's very important for me. I would also say that, uh, uh, that, that we need to be very clear in, in, uh, in, in supporting key NDP principles. So when we're fighting against uh, corporate uh, greed, uh, the kinds of which we see sort of reflected in the culture at the in the Senate, is that we take that further and we, we talk about policies that take on corporate greed more broadly. And I'm proud that our campaign has done that, whether it's in terms of standing up for public ownership, standing against... Uh, uh, Mr. Angus. You know, when Johnny McDonald uh, came up with the Senate, he said it was there to protect the rights of minorities. And I hear young uh, uh, people who are doing the tours all the time, but they don't say when Johnny was talking about minorities, he wasn't talking about new Canadians and indigenous Canadians, he was talking about the rich. That the role of the Senate, there would always be more poor people than the rich. And it is, be it is an exclusive club of insiders. To have in 2017 a group that is not elected and cannot be fired by Canadians I think is a democratic abomination. And we have to make that a priority of getting rid of that. But I think it's not just that we oppose, we have to propose. Because I think that much of our parliamentary life is being diminished now, it's becoming a sideshow. And we have to restore an honour to the people's house. And part of that will be through electoral reform. Part of it will also have to be from re, uh, putting more effort into the tools of the officers of parliament to hold us politicians to account so that we are truly a reflective of what the Canadian people believe in and what the Canadian people want. So uh, the Senate, I think, is an embarrassment for democratic society, but parliament also needs to pick up its game. Thank you. Mr. Caron. Well, uh, abolition of the Senate has been a core policy of the NDP and the CCF since, I think, the beginning. So who am I to argue with tradition? Uh, no, of course, I'm, I, I agree with my colleagues, and we, we have led the fight against the Senate and eventually for the abolition, but also to, uh, to uh, ensure that the Senate and the senators and the institution knows that they are being watched. Uh, in my sense, however, significant action to eventually abolish the Senate will not come on its own. It will need to be part of an inclusive set of reforms to Parliament. Yes, electoral reform is part of them, but we have some major problems right now with the lack of democracy within the House of Commons. And I think we should look into our own house before looking the next house, 
Because the question period is honestly a time in my life, like it's a one hour and a half of my life I will never see back every single day. Because <laughs> question period is, we, we, can't, we can't get a straight answer, and we can't even get an answer that's close to the question that was asked. We need to look at committee work, which is incredibly important. It's not as visible, but it's important, and it's been co-opted by the WIPs and by the Prime Minister's office, and we need to reduce those powers. Thank you. Mr. Singh. Yes, the answer is yes. We absolutely need to do it. Uh, but we also have to propose a way to do it. So let's first talk about the issue. It's literally, as Charlie said, and Guy mentioned, and Nikki all talked, it's literally an affront to democracy. The fact that we have elected officials that can be undermined, that can be undermined by unelected officials. So the will of the people, people want something done. People believe in something. They've elected someone. They try to push it forward. And you have a Senate that can say no. They can reject the will of the people. It's extremely offensive. Now, having a second body might have made sense if it was elected, if it was democratically elected, and if it was proportionally representational to the will of the people. But the current system is a failure, and it's an abomination. It's an affront to our democratic system. It undermines the will of the people. It's, it's so offensive. I, I could go on and on. So what are some of the solutions? We, we, as New Democrats, we believe in abolishing it. Uh, how long will that take? and what the process for it, if we could look at making it an elected position instead and having a second check through an elected position might make some sense. So we need to think of some solutions and those are some potential, potential options. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, we need to deal with it. All right, and to finish our debate, we will now have closing statements of 60 seconds from each of the candidates. And Jagmeet Singh, yeah, you're up first. All right. What's up, everybody? I'm connecting with more and more Canadians looking for a political voice, and I'm bringing them home. New Democrats can no longer tackle climate change, reconciliation, and inequality from the sidelines. We owe it to Canadians to form government. That's why I'm running. I'm bringing new members, new voters, new volunteers into our movement. Je m'engage à battre pour gagner. Les slogans ne seront pas suffisants pour faire grandir notre parti. Winning government demands building bridges of power for new communities. That's why I propose more bold and detailed policy than any other candidate. I've experienced some of the struggles that you're facing, I've, and I know what it means to fight adversity with love and courage for your family, for your communities, for each other. I'll be a fighter in your corner. Together, we can transform this, cover, cover, this country and foreign government in 2019. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Ashton, you're next. And I saw you raise your card. And since you're next, we'll just add 30 seconds to your total time. So that will be 90 seconds. This, this generation of young people is one of the finest generations that have ever grown up in this country. Sure, they're in rebellion against a lot of our standards and values. They have got sick and tired of a manipulated society. They understand that a nation's greatness lies not in the quantities of its goods, but in the quality of its life. My words? No, Tommy Douglas's in 1970. That could apply today. Young people, millennials, the largest single voting bloc in the next election are challenging a system that is failing all of us and this planet. They want change. Les gens de tout âge nous parlent de leur désir de changement. Tonight, I've talked about dreaming again. Here on the prairies, new Democrats have shown that dreams can come true. Medicare pioneered here in Saskatchewan. Le système de retraite et le programme d'assurance emploi. Child care, home care, pharmacare in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Our Alberta NDP government's first $15 an hour minimum wage in Canada. But there is more to do. Let's complete Medicare with pharmacare, dental care, mental health care, ensure decent, affordable housing, make education a right by eliminating tuition, ensure justice for Indigenous peoples, une fiscalité équitable, et protéger l'environnement. We need a politics to believe in again, based on our CCF and NDP roots and the dynamic visions of social movements today for social, environmental, and economic justice for all. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to everyone so far. We just have uh, two more left, and up next is Guy Caron. My friends, whoever wins this leadership race faces a daunting challenge, and there's no point in denying it. Justin Trudeau and the big money machine backing his liberals are no pushovers. But let me tell you, don't let his socks, his socks fool you. Trudeau is a Bay Street big business lackey through and through. 
The next NDP leader will have to figure out a way to expose Trudeau for the poor progressive he really is. And the best way to do it is with a program really transformative and progressive. And that's what I've done since the beginning of this course, and that's what I'm going to do for Trudeau in 2019. There is a true desire for change in this country. If progressive forces are all working together towards a common goal of creating a fairer, greener, and more prosperous Canada, we will do it, because we share the same values as a majority of Canadians. We will not unite this country by pitting Canadians against each other. Unity and clarity of purpose are the keys. So join me, and let's do it together. Thank Thanks. you very much. And up next, Charlie Angus. So my uh, granny was an immigrant mining widow. And every month, she'd come downstairs where she lived upstairs, and she'd wave her old age pension and say to me, the NDP got this for us. What an incredible legacy we have, thanks to the work of Tommy and that generation of NDP dreamers and builders. But when I talk with young people today who say they'll never have a pension, or talk with young Indigenous kids who've given up hope in this nation, and they're only nine or 10 years old, it's time for us to step up with this generation to bring forward that bold vision of change I will be that leader in Parliament this November, standing up to that Liberal machine that's beholden to the hedge fund operators and the privatizers. But I'll also be here because I come from the grassroots, working to bring people together, the rural and the urban, the blue collar and the environmentalists, the Indigenous and new Canadians, to believe that we can do this together. Because what brings us together, my friends, is so much greater than the false politics that would divide us. That's why I'm here, and that's why you're here. Okay, that concludes today's debate, the fifth debate of the 2017 NDP leadership race. How about a round of applause?